we jump back into Unbroken by Laura Hillenbrand, uh, we're starting at chapter 9, which is on page 95. It's called 594 Holes. Sorry, quick pause. I had to get my cup of tea for reading. Uh, anyway, in chapter 4, we learned more about the B-24 crashes, but we also learned some more about the Japanese military during the war. We heard about the rape of Yu King and how violent and scary that was for American soldiers going into the war. And so here we go, continuing with 594 holes. In February 1943, during a brief visit to the equatorial island of Canton, the Superman crew had its first ex encounter with exploding sharks. Canton was a seething purgatory or hell in the shape of a pork chop, consisting mostly of coral and scrubby plants huddled close to the ground, as if cringing from the heat. There was only one tree on the entire island. The surrounding waters were tumbling with sharks, which got trapped in the lagoon at low tide. Bored out of their wits, the local servicemen would tie garbage to long sticks and dangle them over the lagoon. When the sharks snapped at the bait, the men would lob hand grenades into their mouths and watch them blow up. So they're blowing up sharks right now. Um, something that our author, Laura Hillenbrand, does a good job of is helping us understand, like, the human side of war. So not only are these guys, you know, facing the B-24 crashes, which we heard about, but they're also so bored that they're blowing up these poor sea creatures. The Superman crew had been sent to Canton for two missions over Japanese-occupied Macon and Tarawa in the Gilbert Islands. On the first mission, the lead plane made a wrong turn and the men found themselves over Howland, the island that Amelia Earhart had been aiming for when she had vanished six years earlier. They noticed gouges in the Howland runway, the calling cards of the Japanese, meaning the Japanese had bombed there. Once they got sorted out and found Macon, Louis couldn't see his target through the clouds. They made three circles with no luck, so their colonel ordered them to drop the bombs anywhere and get going. Through a gap in the clouds, Louis spotted a row of outhouses and with giggling glee, walloped them with 3,000 pounds of demolition bombs. To a cheer from the crew, the outhouses blew sky high, so we flipped the bathroom. Two days later, the men flew back to the Gilberts to photograph the islands, bringing a six-man camera crew. They buzzed several islands under fire, snapping photos. With Superman's nose bloodied from an anti-aircraft round, they turned back for Canton. 300 miles from home, Engineer Douglas made a discovery. Superman's eccentric fuel gauges, which had been jiggling around, had settled very low. Douglas announced that at their current rate, they wouldn't make Canton. Phil slowed the propellers as far as he dared and leaned the fuel mixture so the least possible fuel was used. The crew shoved out almost everything that wasn't bolted down, and all 15 men crowded into the front of the plane in the belief that it would improve airspeed. Knowing that their chances of making Canton were slim, they considered Howland, but then recalled the pitted runway. They discussed ditching near Howland, but that raised the issue of sharks. In the end, they agreed to try for Canton. So they're running out of fuel, trying to see if they can make it to their destination. Wedged together in the front of the plane, all the men could do was wait. The sun set. Louis stared into the dark below and thought about what it would feel like to crash. The fuel gauges inched lower and everyone waited to hear the engine sputtering out. At last, with the fuel gauges at absolute bottom, Phil spotted a searchlight craning around the sky and runway lights dotting the dark below. Realizing that he was way too high, Phil dropped the plane so sharply that Pillsbury bobbed into the air and hung there a moment weightless before, before slapping down. Um, if a plane dives really, really fast, it's kind of like when you go on a roller coaster. There's just a minute of like zero gravity feel. As Superman touched down on Canton, its tail settled lower than it had been in the air, causing the last drops of fuel to shift back. A moment later, one engine quit. Two weeks later, the men saw what would have awaited them had they gone down at sea. A B-25 flying off Oahu radioed that it was low on fuel, then went silent. Superman was scrambled to hunt for it. After an hour and a half of searching, Louis spotted a curl of gray smoke. Two Catalina flying boats were headed toward it. Superman followed. 
When they arrived at the crash site, the men were astonished oops, by what they saw. Two life rafts holding the entire five-man B-25 crew floated amid plane debris. Around them, the ocean was churning with hundreds of sharks, some of which looked 20 feet long. Knifing agitated circles in the water, the creatures seemed on the verge of overturning the rafts. The Catalinas reached the men before the sharks could, and the B-25 men treated their rescuers to drinks that night. But the Superman crew now understood the feelings of the grenade throwers on Canton. On a later flight, when they saw several sharks harassing six whales, they dove low over the water and shot at the sharks. Later, they felt guilty. On future flights, when they saw sharks, they let them be. So here we want to know a couple of things. One, how uh, common it is for them to run out of fuel and also just the relationship that the crew members have with sharks. They really don't like them um, because the sharks try and eat all of these pilots and their crew as they crash, um, but they will commit to not blowing them up anymore. Nauru was a little afterthought of land. Eight square miles of sand sitting alone in the Pacific, about 2,500 miles southwest of Hawaii. It was the kind of place that the world might have left alone were it not for the 50,000 tons of high-grade phosphate that lay under the feet of the grass-skirted natives. A central ingredient in fertilizer and munitions, the phosphate had been discovered in 1900, and since then the island had been home to a community of European businessmen and Chinese workers who mined the land. When the war began, Nauru became a priceless prize. So the scene is just this little island, but it has phosphate. And they need this phosphate, um, it tells us here, for fertilizer, so for like grain crops, and for munitions, which is weapons. And so all of a sudden, everyone wants to control this little island. Japan seized Nauru in August 1942, imprisoning the Europeans who had not fled and forcing the natives and the Chinese to mine phosphate and build a runway. They enforced their authority with the sword, beheading people for infractions as trivial as the theft of a pumpkin. When the runway was complete, Japan had a rich source of phosphate and the ideal base for airstrikes. Now remember, we are continually hearing about how brutal Japan is being during World War II, and this is another example of that. Um, and this is something that's really important that we're aware of for our story as we, um, we continue to talk about this and see Louis' interactions with the Japanese military. On April 17th, upon returning from Iran, Louis was called to a briefing. America was going after Nauru in a big way, sending Superman and 21 other B-24s to hit the phosphate works. No one in the squadron saw a bed that night. They left just before midnight, refueled on Canton, and flew to Funafuti, the tiny atoll from which they would launch their attack. They found it jostling with journalists brought in by the military to cover the raid. At a briefing, the crews were told to approach Nauru at 8,000 feet. The altitude gave Louie and the others pause. That week, they had made practice runs from 8 to 10,000 feet, and the potential for anti-aircraft fire to butcher them at that altitude alarmed the whole crew. We only hope, Louie had written in his diary two days earlier, we don't bomb that low in actual combat. Pillsbury couldn't stop thinking about something else that the briefing officer had said. There would be 10 to 12 zeros waiting for them. Remember, those are the fast Japanese planes. He'd seen a distant zero at Wake, which is an island, but had never been engaged by one. The idea of a single zero was daunting. The prospect of 12 scared him to death. Before dawn the next day, the men walked together to Superman. With them was a lieutenant named Donald Nelson. He wasn't on the crew, but asked if he could tag along so he could see combat. At 5 a.m., Superman was airborne. Doglegging to the west to hide their point of origin, the planes took six and a half hours to reach Nauru. No one spoke. Superman led the massive bombers, flying with a plane on each wing. The sun rose, and the planes flew into a clear morning. The Japanese would see them coming. At about 20 past 11, Navigator Mitchell broke the silence. They'd be over the island in 15 minutes. In the greenhouse, Louis could just make out an apostrophe of land, flat to the horizon, meaning it looks like just a little apostrophe, that comma shape. Below, there was a black shadow in the water. It was an American submarine, ready to pick up survivors if bombers were shot down. 
That'd be kind of eerie flying over and you just see this big black blob in the water. Superman passed over it and slid over Nuru. Louis shivered. It was eerily silent, like kind of creepy. The first nine planes, Superman out front, crossed the island unopposed. The air was very still and the plane glided along without a ripple. Phil relin relinquished control of the Norden bomb site. Remember, he has to give control of the bomb site to Louis so he can shoot. Superman's first target, a knot of planes and structures beside a runway, came into view. Louis lined up on the gleaming backs of the planes, and then shattering. The sky became a fury of color, sound, and motion. Black hissed up, trailing steamers of smoke over the planes, then burst into black puffs, sparking with shrapnel. Metal flew everywhere, streaking up from below and raining down from above. With the bomb site in control, Phil could do nothing. Something struck the bomber on Superman's left wing, piloted by Lieutenant Joan Jacobs. The plane sank as if drowning. At almost the same moment, the plane to Superman's right was hit. Just a few feet away, Pillsbury watched the bomber falter, drop, and disappear under Superman's wing. Pillsbury could see the men inside, and his mind briefly registered that all of them were about to die. Superman was alone. Louis kept his focus below, trying to aim for the parked planes. As he worked, there was a tremendous bang and a terrific shudder. Much of Superman's right rudder, a chunk the size of a dinner table, blew off. Louis lost the target. As he tried to find it again, a shell bit a wide hole in the bomb bay, and the plane dropped again. And if you're looking at your copy of the book, you'll see it down at the bottom. There's the B-24 making its way for anti-aircraft fire. So they're trying to fly and drop bombs while they're also being shot at here. At last, Louis had his aim, and the first bombs dropped, spun down, and struck their targets. Then Superman passed over a set of red-roofed barracks and an anti-aircraft battery, Louis's second and third targets. Louis lined up and watched the bombs crunch into the buildings and battery. He had one bomb left for a target of opportunity. North of the airfield, he saw a shack and took aim. The bomb fell clear, and Louis yelled, Bombs away! and turned the valve to close the bomb bay doors. In the cockpit, the bomb release light flicked on and Phil took control of the plane. As he did, behind and below the plane, there was a pulse of white light and an orb of fire. Louis had made a lucky guess and a perfect drop. The shack was a fuel depot and he had struck it dead center. In the top turret, Pillsbury pivoted backwards and watched a vast cloud of smoke billow upward. So Louis drops uh, his bomb right where the fuel is and then creates an even bigger celebration or er, celebration sorry explosion there was no time for celebration zeros were suddenly all around louis counted nine of them slashing around the bombers machine guns blazing the boldness and skill of the japanese pilots astounded the bomber crews the zeros flew at the bombers head-on cannons firing slicing between planes that were just feet apart they passed so close that louis could see the faces of the pilots Firing furiously, the bomber gunners tried to take out the Zeros. The shooting was all point blank and the bullets were flying everywhere. One bomber sustained 17 hits from friendly planes or possibly from its own waste guns. Stricken bombers began slipping behind and the Zeros pounced. One bomber was hounded by four Zeros in a biplane. Its gunners shot down one Zero before their pilot found a cloud to hide in, scattering his pursuers. Below, Lieutenant Jacobs, Phil's lost wingman, was still airborne, his plane laboring along on three engines and no right rudder in a circle of zeros. His gunner sent one zero down. Thor Hamron, pilot of the B-24 jab in the ass, saw Jacobs struggling. Circling back and speeding down, he opened up on the zeros with all of his guns. The zeros backed off, and the Jacobs flew on with Hamron on his wing. The first bombers, pursued by zeros, headed out to sea. With its fighters gone and many of its guns destroyed, the Japanese base was left exposed. The trailing B-24 swept in, crossing through rivers of smoke to rain bombs on the phosphate plant. In the last plane over the island, a reporter raised his binoculars. He saw a volcano-like mass of smoke and fire, a burning Japanese bomber, a few bursts of anti-aircraft fire, and not a single moving person. Bill and Cuppernell pushed Superman full throttle for home. The plane was gravely wounded, trying to fly up and over onto its back. It wanted to stall and wouldn't run, and the pilots needed all their strength to hold it level. 
Three zeros orbited it, spewing streams of bullets and cannon shells. The gunners, engulfed in scalding hot, spent scalding hot, spent cartridges, fired back. Mitchell in the nose, Pillsbury in the top turret, Glassman in the belly, Lambert in the tail, and Brooks and Douglas standing exposed at the broad, open waste windows. Louis, still in the greenhouse, saw rounds ripping through the Zero's fuselages and wings, but the planes were relentless. Bullets streaked through Superman from every direction. In every part of the plane, the sea and sky were visible through gashes in the bomber's skin. Every moment, the holes multiplied. So they did their job, they dropped the bombs, but they're trying to get back and they're being shot at and there are holes everywhere. Just as Louis turned to leave the greenhouse, he saw a Zero dive straight for Superman's nose. Mitchell and the Zero pilot fired simultaneously. Louis and Mitchell felt bullets cutting the air around them, one passing near Mitchell's arms, the other just missing Louis's face. One round sizzled past and struck the turret's power line, and the turret went dead. At the same instant, Louis saw the Zero pilot jerk. Mitchell had hit him. For a moment, the Zero continued to speed directly at the nose of Superman. Then the weight of the stricken pilot on the yoke forced the Zero down, ducking under the bomber. The fighter powered down and splashed into the ocean just short of the beach. Louis rotated the dead turret by hand, and Mitchell climbed out. The gunners kept firing, and Superman trembled on. There were still two Zeros circling it. In the top turret facing backward, Stanley Pillsbury had fearsome weapons, twin 50 caliber machine guns. Each gun could fire 800 rounds per minute, the bullets traveling about 3,000 feet per second. Pillsbury's guns could kill a man from four miles away, and they could take out a zero if given the chance. But the zeros were staying below where Pillsbury couldn't hit them. He could feel their rounds thumping into Superman's belly, but all he could see were his plane's wings. Fixated on the nearest zero, Pillsbury thought, if he'd just come up, I could knock him down. He waited. The plane groaned and, and shook. The gunners fired. The zeros pounded them from below. And still, Pillsbury waited. Then Louis saw a zero swoop up on the right. Pillsbury never saw it. The first he knew of it was an ear-splitting, kabang, 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 a sensation of everything tipping and blowing apart, an excruciating pain. The zero, oops, the zero had sprayed the entire right side of Superman with cannon shells. The first rounds hit near the tail, spinning the plate hard on its side. Shrapnel tore into the hip and left leg of tail gunner Ray Lambert, who hung on side, sideways as Superman rolled. The plane's twist saved him. A cannon round struck exactly where his head had been an instant earlier, hitting so close to him that his goggles shattered. Ahead, shrapnel dropped Brooks and Douglas at waist guns. In the belly turret, two hunks of shrapnel penetrated the back of glass who was so adrenalinized, he felt nothing. So his adrenaline's pumping so fast, so hard, that he doesn't even realize he's been hit. Another round hit the passenger Nelson. Finally, a shell blew out the wall of the top turret, disintegrating on impact and shooting metal into Pillsbury's leg from foot to knee. Oh. Half of the crew and all of the working gunners had been hit. Superman reeled crazily on its side, and for a moment, it felt about to spiral out of control. Bill and Cupernell wrenched at level. Clinging to his gun as the shrapnel struck his leg and the plane spin nearly flung him from his seat, Pillsbury shouted the only word that came to mind. Ow! That sounds terrible. He's got metal running down his whole leg. Cluey heard someone scream. When the plane was righted, Phil yelled to him to find out how bad the damage was. Louis climbed from the nose turret. The first thing he saw was Harry Brooks in the bomb bay lying on the catwalk. The bomb bay doors were wide open and Brooks was dangling partway off the catwalk, one hand gripping the catwalk and one leg swinging in the air with nothing but air and ocean below him. His eyes bulged and his upper body was wet with blood. He lifted one arm toward Louis, a plaintive expression on his face. Louis grabbed Brooks by the wrists and pulled him into a seated position. Brooks slumped forward, and Louis could see holes dotting the back of his jacket. There was blood in his hair. Louis dragged Brooks to the flight deck and pulled him into a corner. Brooks passed out. Louis found a cushion and slid it under him, then returned to the bomb bay. He remembered having turned the valve to close the doors and couldn't understand why they were open. Then he saw. 
There was a slash in the wall, and purple fluid was splattered everywhere. The hydraulic lines, which controlled the doors, had been severed. With these lines broken, Phil would have no hydraulic control of the landing gear or the flaps, which they would need to slow the plane on landing. And without hydraulics, they had no brakes. Louis cranked the Bombay burst back by hand. He looked to the room, saw Douglas, Lambert, and Dallas lying together, bloody. Douglas and Lambert were plying along the floor, trying to reach their guns. Nelson didn't move. He'd taken a shot in the stomach. Louis shouted to the cockpit for help. Phil yelled back that he was losing control of the plane and needed cover now. Louis said that this was a dire emergency. Phil braced himself at the controls and Cuppernell got up, saw the men in the back, and broke into a run. He found morphine, sulfa, oxygen masks, and bandages and dropped down next to each man in turn. So they're trying to do first aid to all of their crew who's just been hit um, while they're flying and potentially not able to land because they have no brakes. Louis knelt beside Brooks, who was still unconscious. Feeling through the gunner's hair, he found two holes in the back of his skull. There were four large wounds in his back. Louis strapped an oxygen mask to Brooks' face and bandaged his head. As he worked, he thought about the state of the plane. The waist, nose, and tail gunners were out. The plane was shot to hell. Phil was alone in the cockpit, barely keeping the plane up, and the zeros were still out there. One more pass, he thought, will put us down. Louis was bending over Brooks when he felt a tickle on his shoulder, something dripping. He looked up and saw Pillsbury at the top turret. Blood was streaming from his legs. Louis rushed to him. Pillsbury was still in his seat, facing sideways, gripping the gun and sweeping his eyes around the sky. He looked ab absolutely livid, super mad. His leg dangled below him, his pant leg hanging in shreds and his boot blasted. Next to him was a jagged hole the shape of Texas and almost as large as a beach ball clawed out of the side of the plane. The turret was shot with holes and the floor was jingling with flakes of metal and turret motor. Louis began doctoring Pillsbury's wounds. Pillsbury, swinging his head back and forth, ignored him. Here we go. Before we keep going, this is Pillsbury sitting with his gun. He just looks like such a classic World War II soldier. Right here at the plane. He's got the jacket. It's awesome. Louis began doctoring Pillsbury's wounds. Uh, Pillsbury, swinging his head back and forth, ignored him. He knew that the zero would come back to finish the kill and he had to find it. The urgency of the moment drove the pain into a distant place. Suddenly, there was a whoosh of dark, close upward motion, a gray shining body, a red circle. And remember, that is um, referencing the Japanese flag, which would have been painted on the plane. Pillsbury shouted something unintelligible, and Louis let go of his foot just as Pillsbury banged the high-speed rotator on his turret. The turret grunted to life, whirling Pillsbury around 90 degrees. The Zero reached the top of its arc, leveled off, and sped directly towards Superman. Pillsbury was terrified. In an instant, the end would come with the most minute of gestures, a flick of the Zero's pilot finger on his cannon trigger, and Superman would carry ten men into the Pacific. Pillsbury could see the pilot who would end his life, the tropical sun illuminating his face, a white scarf coiled about his neck. Pillsbury thought, I have to kill this man. Pillsbury sucked in a sharp breath and fired. He watched the tracer skim away from his gun's muzzle and punch through the cockpit of the Zero. The windshield blew apart and the pilot pitched forward. The fatal blow never came to Superman. The Zero pilot, surely seeing the top turret smashed and the waste windows vacant, had probably assumed that the gunners were all dead. He had waited too long. Zero folded onto itself like a wounded bird. Pillsbury felt sure that the pilot was dead before his plane struck the ocean. The last zero came up from below, then faltered and fell. Clarence Douglas, standing at the waist gun with his thigh, chest, and shoulder torn open, brought it down. In the ocean behind them, the men on the submarine watched the planes tussle over the water. One by one, the zeros dropped and the bombers flew on. The submarine crew would later report that not one zero made it back to Nauru. It is believed that thanks to this raid and others, the Japanese never ret retrieved a single shipment of phosphate from the island. Remember, we've been talking about how because Japan is such a small like country of islands, they don't have the resources they need to fight a war. And so unless they can conquer these surrounding areas to get more natural resources, 
they can't continue fighting. And so keeping the Japanese military from this phosphate, phosphate was a huge win for the U.S. The pain that had been far away during the gunfight surged over to Pillsbury. Right? So his adrenaline kind of made him be able to ignore it for a while. As soon as he calms down, that's going to be incredibly painful. Louis pushed the release on the turret chair and the gunner slid into his arms. Louis eased him to the floor next to Brooks. Grasping Pillsbury's boot, he began easing it off as gently as he could. Pillsbury hollered for all he was worth. The boot slid off. Pillsbury's left big toe was gone. It was still in the boot. The toe next to it hung by a string of skin and portions of his other toes were missing. So much shrapnel was embedded in his lower leg that it bristled like a pincushion. Louis thought that there would be no way to save the foot. He bandaged Pillsbury, gave him a shot of morphine, which is like a painkiller, fed him a sulfa pill, then hurried away to see if they could save the plane. Superman was dying. Phil couldn't turn it from side to side with the normal controls, and the plane was pulling upward so hard trying to flip that Phil couldn't hold it with his arms. He put both feet on the yoke and pushed as hard as he could. The nose kept rearing up so high that the plane was on the verge of stalling. It was porpoising up and down. The men who could walk rushed through the plane, assessing its condition. The peril of their situation was abundantly clear. The right rudder was completely shot. A large portion of it was missing and its cables severed. The cables for the elevators, which controlled the plane's pitch, were badly damaged. So were the cables for the trim, which gave the pilot fine control of the plane's attitude, its orientation in the air, and thus greatly reduced the effort, uh, excuse me, reduced the effort needed to handle the plane. Fuel was trickling onto the floor under the top turret. No one knew the condition of the landing gear, but with the entire plane perforated or shot with holes, it was likely that the tires had been struck. The bomb bay was sloshing with hydraulic fluid. So they're not being shot at, and they're still flying, but they're knowing that the chances of them actually being able to land this plane are very low. Phil did what he could. Slowing the engines on one side created a power differential that forced the plane to turn. Pushing the plane to higher speed eased the porpoising, picture like a dolphin, that's a porpoise going up and down and up and down, and reduced the risk of stalling. If Phil kept his feet on the yoke and pushed hard, he could stop the plane from flipping. Someone shot off the fuel feed near Pillsbury and the leaking stopped. Louis took a bomb arming wire and spliced the severed rudder and the elevator cables together. It didn't result in immediate improvement, but if the left rudder cables failed, it might help. So they're just trying to like basically duct tape the plane together kind of a feel so that they can land. Funafuti was five hours away. If Superman could carry them that far, they would have to land without hydraulic control of the landing gear flaps or brakes. They could lower the gear and extend the flaps with hand pumps, but there was no manual alternative to hydraulic brakes. Without bombs or much fuel over aboard, the plane weighed some 40,000 pounds. A B-24 without brakes, especially one coming in hot over the standard of 90 to 110 miles per hour landing speed, could eat up 10,000 feet before it stopped. Funafuti's runway was 6,660 feet long. At its end were rocks and sea. Hours passed. Superman shook and struggled. Lillian Cuppernell moved, there we go, moved among the injured men. Pillsbury lay on the floor, watching his leg bleed. Mitchell hunched over his navigation table, and Phil wrestled with the Douglas limped about, looking deeply traumatized. His shoulder and arm, said Pillsbury, all torn to pieces. Brooks lay next to Pillsbury, blood pooling in his throat, making him gurgle as he breathed. Pillsbury couldn't bear the sound. Once or twice, when Louis knelt before him, Brooks opened his eyes and whispered something. Louis put his ear near Brooks' lips, but couldn't understand him. Brooks drifted off again. Everyone knew he was almost surely dying. No one spoke of it. It was likely they all knew that they'd crash on landing, if not before. Whatever thoughts each man had, he kept them to himself. So even though they survived this crazy uh, fight, they're trying to get back. Uh, their men are all injured and having to survive five hours of just bleeding, slowly dying from their injuries, and knowing that the plane isn't going to make it. Daylight was fading when the palms of Funafuti brushed over the horizon. Phil began dropping the plane toward the runway. 
They were going much too fast. Someone went to the hand crank on the catwalk and opened the bomb bay doors, and the plane, dragging on the air, began to slow. Douglas went to the pump for the landing gear just under the top skid. He needed two hands to work it, one to push the valve and one to work the pump, but he was in too much pain to hold up either of his arms for more than a few seconds. Pillsbury couldn't stand, but by stretching as far as he could, he reached the selector valve. Together, they got the gear down while Louis peered out the side window, looking for a yellow tab that would signify that the gear was locked. The tab appeared. Mitchell and Louis pumped the flaps down. Louis scrounged up parachute cord and went to each injured man, looping cord around him as a belt, then wrapping the rope around stationary parts of the plane. Nelson, with his belly wound, couldn't have a rope wrapped around his torso, so Louis fed the line around his arm and under his armpit. Fearing that they'd end up on fire, he didn't knot the cords. Instead, he wound the ends around the hands of the injured men so they could free themselves easily. The question of how to stop the bomber remained. So here, he's just trying to make sure that everyone's secured um, so that they won't fly everywhere as the plane is crash landing. Louis had an idea. What if they were to tie two parachutes to the rear of the plane, hitch them out of the waste windows at touchdown, and pull the rip cord? No one had ever tried to stop a bomber in this manner. It was a long shot, but it was all they had. So they're going to throw parachutes out the window of the plane, trying to slow it down since they don't have full use of their brakes. Louis and Douglas placed one parachute on each waste window and tied them to a gun mount. Douglas went to his seat, leaving Louis standing between the waste windows, a ripcord in each hand. Superman sank toward Funafuti. Below, the journalists and the other bomber crews stood, watching the crippled plane come in. Superman dropped lower and lower. Just before it touched down, Pillsbury looked at the airspeed gauge. It read 110 miles per hour. For a plane without brakes, it was too fast. For a moment, the landing was perfect. The wheels kissed the runway so softly that Louis stayed on his feet. Then came a violent, gouging sensation. What they had feared had happened. The left tire was flat. The plane caught hard, veered left, and careened toward two parked bombers. Cuppernell, surely more out of habit than hope, stomped on the right brake. There was just enough hydraulic fluid left to save them. Superman spun in a circle and lurched to a stop just clear of the other bombers. Louis was still in the back, gripping the parachute cords. He had not had to use them. Douglas popped open the top hatch, dragged himself onto the roof, raised his injured arm over his head, and crossed it with his other arm, the signal that there were wounded men inside. Louis jumped down from the bomb bay and gave the same signal. There was a stampede across the airfield, and in seconds, the plane was swarming with Marines. Louis stood back and ran his eyes over the body of his ruined plane. Later, ground crewmen would count the holes in, count the holes in Superman, marking each one with chalk to be sure they didn't count any twice. There were 594 holes. All the Nehru bombers had made it back. Every one of them shot up, but none so badly as this. Brooks was laid on a stretcher, placed on a jeep, and driven to a rudimentary one-room infirmary, a little one-room hospital area. He was bleeding inside his skull. They carried Pillsbury to barracks to await treatment. He was lying there about an hour later when the doctor came in and asked him if he knew Harry Brooks. Pillsbury said yes. He didn't make it, the doctor said. And here's a picture of Harry Brooks. Technical Sergeant Harold Brooks died one week before his 23rd birthday. It took more than a week for word to reach his widowed mother, Edna, at 511 and a half Western Avenue in Clarksville, Michigan. Across town on Harley Road, the news reached his fiance, Jeanette Bruchner. She learned that he was gone nine days before the wedding date that they had set before he left for the war. And with that really intense fight scene over, we will pause and uh, get ready for chapter 10. <laughs> 